morning everyone welcome to this this third of October our Holy Communion Sunday such a special moment to be here with you now as we are about to celebrate Holy Communion later on in the service today as we continue with our fruit of the Spirit series we look at that fruit the the eighth fruit of the Spirit that we know as gentleness, gentleness. And today we'll recognize that gentleness is not about being weak, but in fact gentleness is being able to use our strength, our power in loving, kind, self-controlled ways. Before we begin and hear the message, let us open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that today is your day. That today reveals your glory. That today is another day that says to us, our God of power and might, our God of infinite strength was willing to empty himself of everything except his love so that he could gently hold us, be with us, share in our life, share in our stories, share in our joys and hopes, share also in our pain and suffering. Lord God, we come to you now asking that you will hold us gently within your infinite power. Hold us for we are fragile people. Fragile people in the sense that, that there is just so much going on in our lives. There's busyness, there's stress, there's worry, there's anxiety. There's the confusion of where to go next. There's the confusion of what has happened. And yet, Lord, in your powerful hands, as you hold us gently, we know that we will be okay. You will set us right. You will save us from what is wrong. And you will teach us to learn to overcome what is wrong in our lives. Lord, it is through your amazing grace that we are able to come to your table, a table that sets us free from our mistakes and sins, but does so in the most gentle of ways. Lord, we love you and we know you love us. Amen. Amen, friends. And so, yes, as I said today, we continue looking at the fruit of the Spirit, which is gentleness. And there are two, uh, two scriptures that we reflect on so as to, to get an insight into what, what true scriptural and fruit of the Spirit is gentleness is all about and the interesting thing is as we read these two scriptures these two different stories involving Jesus what we'll see is there's almost they they look like they don't go together and yet they do so the first one comes from Luke chapter 8 verse 40 to 48 and so we read now when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jairus, a synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house, because his only daughter, a girl of about twelve, was dying. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for twelve years. But no one could heal her. 
she came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak and immediately her bleeding was stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Jesus said, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him, and now she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. A story we've heard many times, but a story that just captures how soft, Jesus can be when, when people come to him and saying, Jesus, I need you. And then what Jesus is willing to do is just tenderly hold them. Our second reading then comes to us from John's Gospel, chapter 2, verse 12 to 17. And we read these five verses. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and brother and his disciples. There they stayed for a few days. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple course, he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the moneylenders and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. And it's another story that, that shows the strength, the toughness that Jesus displayed whenever he saw injustice or sin taking place. Together these two stories are the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. And so as we reflect on these two scriptures, as I said, we might be surprised by us putting these two scriptures together. We might be surprised also then by what the fruit of the Spirit gentleness really means. You see that great biblical scholar William Barclay once wrote that the word gentle in the New Testament is one of the most untranslatable words in the whole of the New Testament. The English translation that we write down as gentleness within the scriptures often for our ears means something like meek, mild, humble, submissive, timid, unassuming. Just to name a few words that that ring true for us when we hear the word gentleness. But the Greek word we translate as gentleness is the word preotis. Preotis. Well, preotis is more complex than, than just the word we hear as gentle. In fact, the word preotis could even be described as more of a, a paradox. And as we know, paradoxes are famously difficult to access because they embody two truths that logically for us don't seem to fit together. In many ways, they are rationally absurd and an oxymoron, a, a contradiction, or at least that's how they appear to us at first. But the power of a paradox is that a paradox brings together truths we naturally keep separate 
and yet a paradox expects us to uncover the dynamic relationship of the two apparently opposing truths and see that these two apparently opposing truths actually require one another to actually be made whole, to become a whole truth. You see, a paradox is a formula for revealing the whole truth, not just one aspect or the other aspect, but the whole truth. For example, grace. Grace is when Jesus brings together both law and forgiveness. Law and forgiving love, merging those, bringing those together. Both are needed if this is going to be true divine grace. If one goes missing or is lessened, then grace is no longer fully grace. And so what paradox does the word praotis embody? Well, the best way I can describe it is by saying that it is a mystical blend of extreme tenderness and great toughness. Extreme tenderness and great toughness. Now, who would have thought that tenderness and toughness could belong together, going together almost like velvet steel. But Praotis brings them together and Paul says this tender toughness is a fruit of the Spirit which all Christ followers need. Why? Because this is who Jesus was and is. And if we are going to imitate our lives after Jesus, then we need to be tender and tough. We, we need to have tender toughness within our lives to do justice to being disciples of Jesus. Once again, as we reflect on the two texts that we've just read, one with Jesus in the temple, we recognize there was a flash of anger, the righteous indignatious indignation. He was tough when he saw injustice, corruption, exploitation of the poor and the weak. He said, enough is enough. Get out. No more sin, no more abuse will take place. But in the second reading, when he, when he touched, when he was touched by the lonely, sad, desperate, lost woman, he was just so wonderfully tender with her and her situation. He held her tenderly and lovingly and allowed her to know she will be okay. Because Jesus is with her. And, and that's the constant blend of, of his life as described by, to us by scripture. His toughness comes through in his fearless rebuke of the religious establishment. His repeated assault on the hypocrisy of the conventionally religious. He was not afraid to tackle chief priests and governors. He called some people brood of vipers. He faced down soldiers without fear. This was no gentle Jesus, meek and mild. But even more than that, he was tough enough to give his life in innocence for the guilty. He was tough enough to give his life in innocence for the guilty. Yet, on the other hand, his tenderness 
was such that he reached out in limitless care for the least and the lost, the despised and the outcast, the sick as well as the healthy. He cared for those who were the lowest of the lows, but he also cared for the powerful and the privileged who were also in their own way struggling with their own issues in life. He tenderly gave of himself, his time, his attention, his compassion to all who needed him. He loved all with infinite and unconditional love. And he did so with such a gentleness of heart that once again, he was tender enough to give his life in innocence for the guilty. He was tender enough towards our need to give his life in innocence for the guilty. And so Jesus was and is both tough and tender within his gentleness of dealing with humanity. He is Praotis. He is as tough as nails and as, as tender as a dove. And any time we separate those elements from the gentleness of Jesus, we lose the truth of who Jesus was and is. But let me say this. Let me say this, we as humanity, you and I, we really struggle to keep these two elements together. You know, I just think of the fact that we're about to enter into the political campaigning season. And as in the past, I bet you we will hear coming from our politicians things about how tough they are, how strong they are, how they are the only one who will be able to stand up against the corruption of the ANC or the racism of the DA or the chaos of the EFF. They will say things like, we're the only ones able to destroy them. Destroy the other side by the force of their whatever, whatever the politicians will be saying. But it will be force, power, destruction, toughness. Those will be the only words we will hear. But it's funny, as I think of the political campaign season that has already begun, and I think of Jesus, two things jump to mind. One, Jesus is considered to be one of the greatest leaders of all time, if not the greatest leader. But secondly, my mind jumps to the fact, what a terrible, what a terrible politician Jesus would be. On the campaign trail, there would be no place for Jesus. There would be no place for a political candidate who publicly wept. No place for a candidate who washed the feet of others. No place for a candidate who spent all his time with the lowest. How would he fundraise if he didn't go to those fancy meals with the rich and the powerful? There would be no place for a candidate who opened himself towards his enemies, who sacrificed himself for the sake of of those who could not offer him anything in return because they could not protect nor save themselves. There will be no place for a candidate who is who in self-giving love chooses to endure crucifixion rather than decree any limitation on human freedom. A candidate who leaps far beyond the avenging ethics 
of an eye for an eye and instead chooses to forgive the very perpetrators of violence and cruelty against him. There is no place for a candidate in politics such as this who lives for peacemaking, for reconciliation, for unity, for serving others and not self. For someone who wants to show compassion and not careerism. And so we can see how true gentleness, Christ-like, Jesus-like gentleness, is not really part of human nature. And this moves beyond politics. But how then, how then do we develop the fruit of the Spirit called gentleness? How does praotes grow within us? Well, the New Testament indicates that some gardening needs to take place so as to remove some weeds that often prevent the ability of these fruit of the spirits to grow. The first weed we need to remove if we're going to allow praotes, gentleness, to truly grow within us is actually the weed of pride. The weed of pride. How are we meant to learn how to be gentle in the Christ-like manner to be tough and tender if we are not first willing to admit that we don't have all the answers, that we are not perfect. You see, pride, arrogance, egotism always leads to toughness without tenderness. And let me just say that often those who are all tough, with no tenderness, often the driving force behind that need to be tough is actually fear. Either a fear or an insecurity that prevents them to admit that there is a weakness or a brokenness in their life. They are afraid to admit that they have made a mistake and haven't got everything right. Think of how many politicians who will go to any length to, to protect the truth about a mistake or an error in judgment that they have made from, from coming out, from becoming public. And then the way they deal with it is they become, they just become this arrogantly tough, a pride that, that becomes hard. For these people, it is a phony, foamy, um, it is a phony form of self-importance that isn't really about power, but the fear of, of insignificance. And so they try to show that they are in charge. I'm the boss. I'm the director general. I'm the Minister of Finances or the Minister of Health or the Minister. I'm the head of this family. I'm the President or the Chief. Could even say, sometimes we hear it being said in the form of, I'm the Maruti. Do not question me. Or any time somebody says, I am the dot dot dot. Instead, for us to be able to weed out pride, our cry should sound something like that, this, where we say, I am a fellow human being who doesn't know everything, but I am willing to learn. I am willing to learn. I am willing to admit I haven't got it all right. 
The second weed we need to deal with is the weed of deceit. Gentleness is tied to truth, not pretense. Praotes is not about lying about who we are or who others are. If we or others have flaws, problems, sins within our character that are causing damage, let us deal with it. Let us not say, you know, I, I have this little problem, but it's not that big a deal. Maybe I can just ignore it. Maybe others don't even notice it. Or maybe someone is doing something that is hurting you deeply or causing harm to others on a deep level. But for the sake of not making an issue out of it, we just put up with it, we ignore it, we lie to ourselves and they say, oh, oh it's just something they do, they, they, will, they will grow out of it. Oh no, they will stop it soon enough. No, that's not it. Real gentleness is being honest enough to admit that you are hurting others or that others are hurting you and then dealing with it. Dealing with it in tender toughness. Love yourself enough to be honest with yourself about what is wrong in your life. Love your friends and family enough to be honest with them about what is wrong in their lives. Now remember we do this not to hurt them, but to tenderly care for them with tough, honest love. Gentleness is about facing what needs to be faced and dealing with it, not lying as to why you won't face these issues. Oh, I, I just need to love me for me, or oh, I, I just want to keep the peace, therefore I don't want to challenge so-and-so. But as we remove these two weeds of pride and deceit, so then we then make space for the spiritual fruit of gentleness to grow. And as it grows, we then become both brave and compassionate in how we live our lives. And this is why Jesus was able to give himself on the cross. Give himself on the cross in his innocence for us, the guilty his compassion for us gave him the bravery to die on the cross for you and for me. His tenderness towards you and me gave him the toughness to face the worst the world could throw at him and still prevail through resurrection and redemption for us all. And so we come to this holy table to celebrate a gentle God, a God of law abiding and forgiving grace. A God who will not put up with our sin and therefore demands that it be dealt with and yet at the same time is willing to lovingly forgive us so that we may know life in and through him by his act of tough tenderness. And so on the night on which our Lord was to be betrayed, he used his immense power to do something that no one else could do. And that is to hold a broken humanity within his love and grace. But to hold us so softly, so caringly, so thoughtfully. 
And so on the night, he took bread, he gave thanks, he blessed it, and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body broken for you. Because out of my tender love for you, I want the best for you. I invite you now to lift up your bread and to break it with me. And let us together hear the words of Jesus as he says, This is my body broken for you. Take and eat and do this in remembrance of me. <coughs> in the same way after supper, Jesus took the cup. He gave thanks. He blessed it. And he said to the disciples, this is my blood poured out for you and for many in a new covenant. Because of my toughness, I will not let sin prevail. And therefore this blood of mine removes that sin. Removes it from you and from the world so that you can be with the Father. And so I invite you to lift up your cup and to hear the words of Jesus as he says, This is my blood poured out for you. Drink it for the forgiveness of your sins. And whenever you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Heavenly Father, thank you for the tender toughness that your Son was willing to share with us. That through his body and his blood, we are both loved and forgiven. Where through his body and the blood, both the law and forgiving loveness is brought together in unity through who Jesus is your Son and our Lord and Saviour is. And so Lord, hear us now as we say the words that your Son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. My dear friends, may you hear the invitation to live a life of tender toughness within the, the spiritual fruit of gentleness a gentleness that does not lie down but a gentleness that instead uses its strength to do what is right to use its strength to help those who need to be helped and looked after a gentleness that uses its strength to make the world a better place but also a gentleness that uses strength to reflect on our own lives and to be gentle enough with us for us to be able to go through real transformation. Go and be in the gentleness of God. And so let's lift our hands together as we say, and now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, 
and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace, go in love, and go and live in the gentleness of your Lord and Saviour.